This is Duke University. Thank you all, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I was a 97 grad, so it's been a few years, but before I um, jump into things, I just wanna you know, start out recognizing that I am you. I am you, and I am you. It's not so many years ago that I would have been sitting in your seat, right next to your seat. Uh, in fact, I might have not even been in the room because I didn't have a clue what entrepreneurship was. I think there were probably, uh, there was, I think, a group, uh, a club, but it was probably three people, and I wasn't one of them. And let's be frank, I don't know if I would have gotten into the number one business school in the country now. So, uh, so I'm really no different than where you were at that time. Um, now, I did have, uh, I guess, a little bit of an adventure spirit. I, I did. Um, after undergrad, uh, joined the Peace Corps, did work with the Peace Corps in Central America for a couple years. I did a joint environmental program, uh, if you consider that adventurous in some way while I was here. I did uh, work in Mexico for a summer internship, did an exchange in Belgium, but I think really all that would have prepared me to do is maybe do, I don't know, ecotourism guides in Nicaragua or something. It certainly did not prepare me for um, starting a, a, a beverage business. Um, so I think, um, but I think I've learned a few things. I, I did um, uh, start Zico in, in 2004, um, built that up to be a brand worth um, a couple hundred million dollars uh, when there really was virtually no coconut water category before. And uh, Coca-Cola did buy the brand in 2013 and is now in the process of scaling it globally hopefully achieving one of our original objectives of building a billion dollar brand. Uh, it is a billion dollar category around the world when it didn't exist 10 years ago. And I think it's made a certain impact in uh, the marketplace in its own way and, and certainly in the 85 countries around the world that grow coconuts and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, and I have learned a few things as well. I've, I've um, looked at you know, probably a thousand business plans over, over the years. I've talked with hundreds of entrepreneurs. I've invested in a couple de dozen businesses, so lived some of the good and bad. You're sampling a few of them here, some beverage and snack food, uh, ba mainly health and wellness, um, sort of better for you food and beverage products. Um, some are winners, a couple there. I, I think I have a chance of being building our brands. Some that aren't here didn't make it, so I've lived through kind of the good, bad, and the ugly. Um, but I also uh, have no idea if I'm a ser serial entrepreneur, right? I might be one and done. So I, I can't tell you about what it's like to be a serial entrepreneur. I can't tell you what it's like to IPO or build a tech company, um, but I'll share with you what I, what I can from my experience. And one thing I've learned and really believe um, is true about entrepreneurship in general, and the panelists were talking a little bit about this, is first of all, I do believe that they are made, not born. I know very few uh, entrepreneurs that were, I had a lemonade stand at eight, and then I did this, and then I, and, and those that I do know aren't running big businesses today, aren't making big impacts. They're doing normal things in their community, which is fine, but I think entrepreneurs are made. I think they're not your typical um, A-type male that's aggressive, that wants to make a ton of money, that is a great, uh, public speaker that dresses like a banker, and they're, they're, they're all over the map. They're all over the map. I've met incredible entrepreneurs that are um, doctors, that are priests, that are social radicals, that are social misfits, and they've successfully found something that works for them. And I also believe that we need more of them. I think there's a lot of problems in the world. I think there's a lot of challenges that we face um, this generation, this country, certainly around the world. And I'm not betting on our government. I'm not betting on Duke University as great as it is. I'm not betting on uh, corporations to make those changes that are necessary. I'm not betting on NGOs. I'm betting on you. I'm betting on future entrepreneurs that are gonna find ideas that have the opportunity to change the world. And, and that's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. If I can play any role and helping to spark that, 
then uh, I've accomplished why, uh, why I'm here. And if I can uh, give you a little thoughts along the way, then uh, hopefully it's worth your while as well. So recognizing disruption was the topic, and, I, and I, I thought that was interesting, but I really want to focus on being the disruption, right? I'm not, I'm not an analyst. I don't look at industries and understand how to, you know, what's the best way to go in and go after it. I, I, I like being it. I like to find people and work with people that are going to be that disruption. And, and, and what I want to focus on mainly is doing it by finding the entrepreneur within you. And, and I believe that, you know, there's, you could talk for hours about marketing and strategy and fundraising. And I'll, I'll touch on those subjects briefly. But you've got those skills, right? That's why you're here. You're learning those things in Fuqua. You can learn those things online. I want to spend time on the personal side. What did it take for me to find an entrepreneur inside? And what do I think uh, you can perhaps learn from that? And what have I seen some other successful entrepreneurs do it as well? So um, after I left Fuqua, um, I went to work for international paper. I um, didn't really have an interest in investment banker consulting, and frankly, I don't think I could have gotten a job in any of them. So I went for a least, less competitive route. I went to work for uh, the packaging and paper industry. I uh, dragged my wife, who I met here, but went to UNC Chapel Hill, but she's a great woman, I, I swear. <laughs> um, and, and we moved to Memphis, Tennessee for a couple years, but the main reason we went there is international paper at the time had about half a dozen businesses in Latin America, and they were looking for you know, young MBA types to go run them eventually. And the deal was you gotta live in Memphis for two years, prove your worth, and then if there's an opportunity, you can go run a business. Um, so, so we did move to Memphis, and, and my interest in that was, um, frankly, driven by a lot of insecurity. You know, when I was here at Fuqua, I wasn't great at anything. You know, I was okay at marketing, okay at finance, okay at ops, but there were people that were so much better than me. And more than wanting to prove that I could integrate it all, I just wanted to j just, I, I was insecure about my ability anywhere else. So I figured if you can't do, be a specialist in anything, you'd be a generalist. And what's a generalist? It's a CEO or a general manager. So I, I took the leap um, and, and moved from Memphis to El Salvador with my wife, dragged her along there. But, but we loved it. We, I'd been in Peace Corps there. My wife had backpacked around Central America. So, so we loved it. And somebody's going to pay me to live there and you know, uh, um, um, run this business, I was thrilled. So for five years, um, I ran a business starting in Central America, but then eventually ran it in all of Latin America, uh, basically Mexico to Brazil, selling uh, packaging for beverages, juice and, and, and milk cartons, but the equipment and services that go along with them, not exactly the sexiest business in the world. Uh, Fuqua kind of kind of squeezed the uh, uh, long-haired, uh, 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 short wearing Peace Corps volunteer out of me and got me in a suit and tie and you know so I, I you know um, made the cover of the local magazine local newspaper in El Salvador for the work I was doing but it was fun I got a chance to use I don't know you guys still do ropes course and stuff like that in your orientation so I got a chance to use some of that with my team whatever it is the fall of trust uh, from uh, eight feet of eight feet off the ground um, so it was a great experience I, I, I loved it but five years into that became the, uh, the question, what next? So uh, we loved living there, um, but it was five years was enough. We were ready to move on. I was ready to move on professionally. I had some opportunities in international paper to move elsewhere, but what was clear to me is a couple things. One, I wasn't wild about the packaging industry. Two, my wife wasn't wild about me being in the packaging industry. Um, and all roads led, led back to Memphis, which was great, but it wasn't where we wanted to live. And so I was at a crossroads. So I remember uh, around this time, in fact, this would have been December of 2003, I'm in a bar in South Beach, and I am drinking a martini, and it's gin, not Bulldog, which didn't exist then. But I'm having a, uh, I'm having a, uh, probably my third uh, uh, martini with a friend. And this friend says to me, Mark, um, I know, everybody knows you're going to leave international paper at some point. What do you want to do? What do you, what, have you ever thought about starting something? And what are you going to do? And I said, well, look, you know, I'd love to join. I'd love to be part of starting something new. But I'm not the idea guy. I've never had an idea. I've never been the creative one. Um, and, and, and I'm also not the money guy. I'm not a banker. I, I don't have any money. I don't have friends with money. I don't know how to raise money. But maybe I can manage it. Maybe I can be the guy that takes it from zero to 10 million or 10 million to 100 million or 100 million to a billion. 
if I can just find the right idea and somebody to write the checks. And my friend looks, looks at me across the, the, the table and says, Mark, the only, the only difference between you and an entrepreneur is an idea, and you are as capable as anyone of coming up with an idea. So I said, yes, that's what I needed. So gin inspired and a little hungover the next day, I uh, flying back to El Salvador, I start brainstorming. I'm brainstorming ideas, all these ideas. And I sit down with my wife in the evening over a glass of wine, and we're talking about them. And the first one is, I'm going to consolidate the dairy industry of Central America. So there's, I'm selling to these companies. There's a bunch of them. They're very inefficient. I'm going to do a roll-up and make them more efficient. And da, da, da. I, I didn't know what the heck I was talking about, but it sounded very, very fuqua to do a roll-up. And my wife looks across from me and says, uh, why do we want to be in the dairy industry? Isn't that kind of what you're in? Isn't that what you're trying to get out of? And I'm like, oh, yeah, shoot, I forgot about that. So nix that idea. And, and, and the next couple of days later, I come back, and it's, it's trucking. It's trucking. So I was part of this Central America Free Trade Agreement um, negotiating committee from the American Chamber of Commerce. There was expectation that after NAFTA was going to be Central America, there was going to be this big need for transportation. So there'll be a need for trucking. And, and I'm walking my wife through the logic of this, and, and, and she says, but Mark, didn't like two years ago, you got in this big hassle with the, with the uh, DEA because one of your company's international papers trucks was used to transport cocaine from Panama to Honduras? And weren't there like gangs involved? And so, oh yeah, I forgot about that. So, so I started to realize I need, a, um, I need a, a screening process. I need some mechanism to look for ideas. Unlike what Kip said, I decided I want to go after this, but I need to find an idea. Um, so I started a screening process, and uh, it was really the pass the mora, my wife test. So as you would expect, there were some typical MBA elements to that. Is it audacious? Does it have good growth potential? Does it have high margins, gross and profit? Can we differentiate? You know, all the kind of classic things you might expect from a business standpoint. But what I realized as well is, that um, if, if I worried that um, am I going to be able to commit my life to this? From everything I read, it's 10 years to get something off the ground. What's it going to take for me to be able to do 10 years? Somebody talked about passion early. Can I really be passionate about this business? Is it consistent with our lifestyle? Does it work for my wife and I? Does it, does, it, does it allow us to live where we want to live? Does it allow us to travel where we want to travel? Will it keep us connected to Central Latin America, which we love so much? And what are these little girls going to think about it in 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 years? My daughters were then born, teeny little things. But I started to think, how do I make this personal? How do I make it more than the MBA stuff, more than the numbers, more than the money? How do I make it personal? And the more I thought about that, I thought, okay, well, that's good. Personal is important. But, and I'm a selfish enough guy, I can, I can focus on that for a while. But I thought, if I'm really going to get myself, my family, my um, attract investors and employees to this thing, I've got to think bigger about this. How can I find purpose around this? How can we find something that, for us, we believe is going to make a difference in people's lives, small as it might be, and maybe even a difference in the world? And I thought, if I can find those things, I'll pass the Mora test. I'll be able to commit myself to this. And perhaps we can get something that other people will get drawn to and attracted into this. So those are the criteria. So how did, how did coconut water get on the list? So versus um, the typical low-hanging fruit scenario, let's call this high-hanging fruit. Um, I don't believe that often these ideas are right in front of you, but I do do find that they're within your sphere. Um, in, in, in my case, that, that was the case. So I wish I could say I was sitting under a tree and it fell under my, on my head, but it does happen, so much so that they warn about this in, in certain countries. I think this is the Philippines. Um, but really, anybody that's been through the tropics understands that coconuts are everywhere, from India to the Philippines to Cuba to Mexico. Street sides, you know, beachfront uh, across the 85 countries of the world that grow coconuts, this is what you see. Um, and it was, a, it was true in El Salvador where we were living. So we drank it all the time. We'd go to the beach. We'd crack it open. It's a good mixer. I did mix it with some gin, sometimes rum, sometimes vodka. It's a natural hangover cure. We'd have a picture of it in the fridge. So when visitors came down and drank a little too much, you pull it out. 
My wife was in public health. Uh, she was aware of its uses in rural community, communities where people were literally use it as a clean source of drinking water, as a rehydration solution, something they give pregnant women when they're out of reach of medical care. It really has incredible, incredible uses. But it was there, something we saw, but it was interesting enough to make the list. And this is a typical story. This is my sister and a friend uh, you know, enjoying its uh, stand side somewhere. So, but what really excited us about that opportunity was when we started to put it through the screens, it had big business potential. You know, all of a sudden I realized, wow, this is the, the actual properties of it, high in electrolytes, low in calories, uh, uh, low acidity level, function like a replenishment drink, and in fact function like a Gatorade. Could this be the natural Gatorade? That's a pretty big idea. Beverages tend to, when they're well branded and positioned, have good margins. They are scalable. There's ways to differentiate. On a personal standpoint, my wife and I have always been very active, very healthy, so it was consistent with that. It would keep us tied to Latin America. Um, talk about a, a public health coup. You know, my wife uh, would always talk about, and we looked at this imagining someday that um, Coca-Cola is selling this around the world, and that was part of our plan from the beginning. Let them make a billion dollars off selling something healthy, bringing replenishment to the world versus high calorie artificial beverages. Um, and the 85 countries that grow coconuts around the world are poor. They all need additional development. There's opportunity and need everywhere, but we were particularly excited about that part of the world and making an impact there. So it met all the criteria on, on, on that front for us. So someone's asking me before, well, what do you, what do, you do? Where do you learn? Um, I think there's, there's huge value in this. And as an outsider to this industry, I did go through that process. And for me, it's learn from the best and the worst. Um, so in the beverage industry, there's a, there's a, a well-trodded path. Um, that fact started with Coke 100 years ago on sampling, on distribution in local markets. It started in Atlanta, and then it branched out. But that's a story most people have forgotten about. The more recent ones probably started with Snapple in the 80s focused in New York, building with a limited market, focusing on distribution, building an audience for a period of time, and then expanding, followed by Sobe, Nantucket Nectars, Red Bull, Monster, Vitamin Water, and others. So there was, there was plenty of data out there. There was plenty of opportunity to research to understand what did they do? How did they do that? Some of it available, probably much more so now, just given what's, what's online than it was 10 years ago when I started. But still, there was plenty of available people I could talk to about it to learn as much as I could about this industry um, and develop a game plan. My goal from the beginning, someone before was talking about disruption, my goal was to go at, at it from a different perspective in the market. Do we choose a different route to market? Do we go after consumers in a different way? Uh, uh, not like other stories we've heard, uh, um, that, that found to be more of a challenge than I expected. But the, one of the greatest challenges for me was to learn not just the industry, but about life, about myself. So, first prize for somebody that can name one, only one person on this, on this, uh, okay, there's one. That's, that's the easy one. Next. Come on. Somebody. No one. Wow, the things you learn in MBA and you don't learn in the world. Um, this is Jack Canfield. Uh, he was the inventor of Chicken Soup for the Soul. Um, but he also wrote a book called The Success Principles, one of many, many, many self-help books, but I'll talk about that a little bit. And this is Eckhart Tolle, Power of Now. The point for me was I realized before I start, was thinking about starting Zico, I would looked at these sort of things and the whole self-help rack and that whole world and thought, it's garbage, it's garbage. I have an MBA. I understand science. Show me the data. I want to understand what, what's factual. What I realized when I was starting is that was my biggest weakness. That was my Achilles heel, was not being 100% confident in myself, not being confident that I knew what, it, what I had to do to get this done. I had the analysis. I had the business ideas. Did I really have what it was going to take to get through the 10 years hard time, to go through the ups and downs, especially given that I was married and had kids? So I took ideas wherever I could get them, right? Corny as they may sound, they made an impact for me, and they were very important what I did. From Tony Robbins, it was all you ever need is inside you now. All you ever need is inside you now. Well, what does that mean? You don't need to go outside and find experts? No, it means you make, like Kip was saying, 50 calls to people, right? That is within you to get through that. You build the network. You raise the money. You do whatever it takes to get it done, if it means 
has purpose to you and has a, a, a it's personal. Um, Eckhart Tolle, it's, it's live in the present. It's the power of now. It's now. And, and I found that to be incredible, incredibly valuable to be in a discussion and be in a discussion. Not worried about tomorrow, not worried about yesterday, not worried about what's going to happen, but to have that discussion and have that with employees, have that with distributors, have that with myself, and recognize that the reality is not, nothing else matters than this moment. From Jack Canfield, corny as it sounds, limiting beliefs. I realized I had a lot of limiting beliefs. Why, how can I be so greedy to want more? How can I want to make money and build a successful business? To twist that around and say, yeah, you know, you know what? I want to build a business that's going to make an impact in the world. It's going to change people's lives. And when I am successful, I'm going to give back and help and support. So I found that it was equally valuable for me to learn from the best and the worst, people that had gotten it wrong on the personal side as well as the business side. Now, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, disruption and, and look at it from a couple aspects. One is design. Um, I've become a real fan of design. It's an, a fast company, always talks about design. I'm sure in every one of your classes, there's some element of design. I came to understand the power of that and what it means, not just in a visual standpoint, not just in a, in a, in a, in a, in a branding standpoint, but really in a, in, a, in a thought process, in a methodical, disciplined way to approach it. But for us, it did start from the brand. And so I set out from the beginning to design a disruptive brand, to, to design something that from a visual standpoint, from a taste profile standpoint, from a positioning standpoint, from what the DNA of the brand was, it was going to be disruptive. That did come from the name as well, making up a name that was short, memorable, non-offensive, had no significance in the nine major world languages, but was something we could own and build what it stood for. Packaging that, 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 that called back for people that, whether you grew up in India or Thailand or have traveled to Puerto Rico or Mexico, you could get that sense of replenishment uh, from the packaging. Um, and, and, um, and a taste profile that was, uh, although polarizing to a lot of people, frankly, was as close and true to the authenticity of coconut water that we could get in a very clean label. One, two, or three ingredients, all natural. That was cr critically important to us from the beginning in making sure that we were designed for disruption. And also, what we did in this process was went out to supermarket shelves, photographed, you know, the equivalent of 100 feet of beverage shelf space and understand how challenging it is to stand out, how difficult it is. And the goal was to design a brand that would stand out from 50 feet away on the shelf. But at the same time, I tried to think about it on a, disrupting on a business model standpoint. And I mentioned the classical business model, routes to market. We tried that doing Amazon and direct and going ourselves and found that we actually fell into a pretty conventional model. But what I was determined was that the business was going to have goals that made it more than just selling beverages. The first was to replenish the world, naturally, that we believe that, look, people are going to drink beverages, they need to drink beverages. The fact is we drink a lot of crap, and it makes an impact in our lives. And so we felt if we can play a little role, 20 years from now, kids are drinking coconut water, frankly, regardless of the brand, instead of some of the stuff out there, the world's just a little bit better. Secondly, improve the lives in the developing world, but sustainably. So the wonderful thing about coconut water is, when the time we got in the market, it was a waste stream. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a massive industry, um, ma mainly geared around oil, meat, um, and some other byproducts that predominantly were used across Asia. But, but you know, plantations that were literally, uh, uh, plants that were literally cracking a million coconuts a day and throwing away the water. So it was a waste product. Not a cheap one, because there's a lot of costs involved in getting it, but still. So we were able to create an industry with virtually no negative environmental impact. And the job creation side versus, you know, one of the pet, pet peeves I had with coffee working in Central America is you could pay $17 for a cup of Starbucks. The value comes in the brand, the retail, the roasting, right? And what gets cascaded down to the farmers is, is nil. Coconut water has to be produced locally. It has to be extracted locally, and the majority of the value is added locally. So they're not just farms picking coconuts, but it's processing, it's technology, it's food service, it's management. And there have been, um, over the last 10 years, I, I, I have a difficult time tracking it, but at least three to $500 million invested in these countries uh, to produce 
mainly coconut water, but also coconut uh, alternative products. We also wanted to create an environment where we as a team, I personally and the rest of those around us in the company and everybody we touched had an opportunity to learn, contribute, and grow together and, 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 and individually and, and together. And to, in general, to build a brand and promote a healthy, natural, active lifestyle everywhere. The reality we recognized was from the beginning until today, we're selling to an upper class market, right? We're not selling to a market that arguably needs it from a nutrition and health and wellness standpoint, but that's our goal is to bring it down. And, and one of the plans that we've had with, with Coca-Cola is to bring costs down, bring pricing down, make this more accessible, but also our marketing activities, our outreach, has, uh, our, our social service work has predominantly been in low income communities that, 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 that we think can benefit from this. But at the same time that we're building a disruptive brand, we're building a disruptive model, we're trying to make this big impact. How do we do it so I don't, don't disrupt my life? Because <laughs> right? what's the point? I remember my wife gave me a couple years ago, uh, around the time we were starting Zico, somebody had written a book about all these startups that had never sold, that had stayed independent, that had gone their own way. It was right around the time we were negotiating a deal with Coke. And I was thinking, thanks, now I feel like a schmuck. Right? I know. But then I read underneath, the, 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 the story underneath the story. So founder of Anchor Steam, I think, was one of the companies. Builds a successful brand, stays independent, but he wasn't able to run the company very well for a period of time because he had a heart attack, and his wife left him, and the kids don't like to see him. So what I realized then was um, I needed to think about it differently, and this came, very, um, came to me very clearly from a conversation I had with my beautiful wife, Mora. So we were about to launch Zico. We we're six months away from launching Zico. So this would have been uh, probably uh, December of, no, actually three months away. So it would have been March of 2004. I still have my day job with International Paper. I'm traveling like crazy. Argentina, Chile, Venezuela. I come home to El Salvador one night. Um, come home early enough to go and help, my, help Mora bathe our little girls and put them to bed. And we sit down for, for a dinner, and we haven't had dinner together in probably, probably a week. We're living a, a very fancy life at the time, uh, expat lifestyle, so we have a housekeeper um, who makes a wonderful dinner. So we have, she makes her uh, shrimp enchiladas, which are amazing, and Juana serves them to us in our beautiful dining room. I crack open a bottle of wine, put on some music. We're finally relaxing and sitting down and reconnecting. And my phone rings. And Maura says, don't get it. And I look at it and say, it's my sister. And she still says, don't get it, because she knows it's not a personal call. My sister is a brilliant architect, and she was our designer. She did all the packaging design and the branding for Zico. She was calling because we had a packaging run scheduled in Brazil. If we missed that packaging run, we'd miss the production. We missed the production, we missed the ship. We missed the ship, we missed the trade show in June. We missed the trade show in June. We might as well launch next year. We miss it all. And so I take the call. I'm on for five minutes. We talk about a few things I put down the phone. No big deal. Well, Maura looks at me from across the table, sits up tall, and says, it will not be this way. It will not be this way. Mark, come on. You just got back from a trip. You're never around. You don't see the girls. If you're not doing stuff on IP, you're doing all this stuff for Zico. What's the point? What's the point? So I'm thinking to myself, I'll tell you what the point is. I don't say this yet. I'll tell you what the point is. I'm trying to build a life for us. I'm trying to do something in the world. You love this lifestyle. I got to work for this lifestyle. We might get shipped off to Belgium. Maybe we don't want to go to Belgium. We have student debt. We just paid it down. We want to change the world. We want to make this impact. This is what it takes to be an entrepreneur. This is what it's about. You're going to have to get used to this. <laughs> Divine intervention. I never said a word. I didn't say that. I sat and I thought. I caught my breath and I tried to listen to her, to myself, to something a little deeper. And I got it. And I said, honey, I get it. You're trying to set the bar higher. How do we do that but not lose ourselves, lose our sanity, lose our health, lose our relationship, lose our souls? 
in this process? How do we make it work for us as well? How do we not disrupt our lives? So that becomes a taller task now, right? So now I've got to build a brand, got to figure out how to launch it, but I've got to stay, try to stay, stay sane in the process. But that's the kind of challenge that, that, that I was up for. So I want to talk a little bit about um, execution now. And we coined a phrase that was very helpful um, that I think sounds like it worked for Bulldog as well, which is inch, mi inch, inch, deep, while, uh, inch wide, mile deep. Focus. Focus wherever you are. So for us initially, that was yoga studios. So this is a, a yoga studio in New York, a small chain, a group of yoga uh, uh, studios that operate under Bikram, Hot Yoga. Uh, do a competition, believe it or not, and it's fascinating to watch these people compete in, in, in yoga, but hundreds of them. There's dozens of studios, thousands of participants, hundreds of uh, 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 practitioners that, that actually compete in this. And uh, Zika was such a part of it that they put us on the, you know, in the Statue of Liberty's hand there. That community was one that made a lot of sense for us. This type of yoga is active, it's not passive. 27 positions over 90 minutes at 104 degrees, you sweat. You need replenishment. They, they, this is an audience that travels. Many of them travel to the Caribbean, they've traveled to India, they've traveled to Mexico. They've, they're familiar with coconut water, they're probably buying it down the street from the local green grocer for five bucks a pop. Um, but Gatorade's the antichrist to them, right? It doesn't represent anything they stand for. Artificial, high in sugar, day glow colors, lightning bolt, it's not them. So that was the audience that we focused on. And, and for a period of time, we really narrowed our focus on New York. But it wasn't just New York, it was Manhattan. But it wasn't just Manhattan, it was neighborhoods. So we got to a point where we were geolocating yoga studios in, 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 uh, in blue and finding that stores around them. So for a period of time, our goal was only be in yoga studios and be in every yoga studio and get them to the point where we're not selling four or five units a week. We're selling 20 or 30 cases a week. It's so ingrained in that practice and so ingrained in what they do, and the studios are selling it out to for people to bring home. Then we went to the neighborhoods around them. Then we did the same thing from Manhattan into Brooklyn. Then we did it in Queens. Then we did it in the Bronx. Then we moved to Long Island. And the whole time, the goal was to move from influencer to mainstream, to pick an audience and that we could build our base in and, and expand it. And following that became follow the yogis. How do we move from that, execute that strategy outside of New York and, and the rest of the country? So we got to a point where when we were doing four million in revenue, I'd say two and a half of that was New York City, and probably half of that was in yoga studios. So we had a model we felt was replicable. And at the time, some people did question, is yoga that big? Lululemon was just getting off the ground, right? It had, now it's what, a 10 billion valuation, if not higher, right? So that's not a niche audience. But we also knew it wasn't just about yoga studios. That was our starting point that we wanted to expand beyond. Now, our business model didn't exactly flow that way, but that was at least the story that we were able to tell. Uh, to investors, and it, and, it, and it did catapult us and allow us to build uh, beyond that. Running through walls. So the reality is that um, no business, uh, no man is an island, no woman is an island, right? You need people around you and with you to execute anything, anything in this world. And our catchphrase when we were interviewing people, looking for people to come work for Zico was, will they run through walls? Will they, if I tell them to, Will they put down their head and do their best to run through that darn wall? That's what we were looking for in the kind of energy we wanted to create. It started with us. So this is my wife and girls uh, doing a giveaway in, in, uh, in uh, uh, probably Union Square, I think it was. Um, the reality was we probably had an excess production and plenty of free product we had to give away. So what do I do? Pack up the kids and the wife and the van and drive into the city and give it away, right? But that sort of commitment to the brand and the commitment to the business um, is what allowed us to attract people that would help us replicate that. This was actually our upgraded car. Uh, so originally I had a, a brown piece of crap van that we drove around in and sometimes had more parking tickets and sales in a month. Does that sound familiar? We upgraded to a CRV, a branded CRV that I got to drive around for a while. And I'm sure there were times when my wife said, wait a second, you paid how much for an MBA? and you ran a $100 million company with 300 employees across Latin America and sat on boards of directors of companies, and now you're driving around a little van and packing out boxes. That's what it takes. 
Originally, sorry for the poor imagery here, but this was uh, originally it was just a little bit of facings in a yoga studio right next to vitamin water. But over time, we were able to hire a few more people, all fanatical about the brand, all willing to go out and do demos and events on the weekend, really create some buzz and excitement about it. Um, so fanatical that they're willing to run a, ma run a marathon wearing a Zico outfit. We did as well get some good press, um, real help. This is, you know, sort of uh, now do these magazines even exist, right? But back then it was, uh, social media was just getting off the ground, so magazines made a big impact. We did get some celebrities involved. There's Giselle drinking it. That was, none of that at the time was paid or endorsed, just things that we caught that celebrities were getting it from their yoga studios or from their trainers who were teaching yoga at the same time. So it was a good, good audience and connection. But we were able to increase our placement and then go from the yoga studios. Initially, it was just some very small placements in little retailers, little bodegas, little natural food stores around New York. Started to grow more presence and started to at least uh, get a little better presence than even our uh, friends in Atlanta sometimes uh, in select markets and expand beyond that. So we were able to, by keeping that narrow focus, we were able to get to a point where we, weren't, we were getting case stacks that were bigger than Coke in a lot of these stores. And that's the something that got us excited, it got retailers excited, it got investors excited, and it ultimately got Coke excited. But when it really started to take off was when we were able to build a team. And, and this team came on little by little over the years. We started with, you know, we had some ups and downs. We started out of the gate with about four or five full time. We had to back down to none and start to build back up and eventually had um, about 85 employees um, in 2013. And the team was so passionate, in times much more so than me. They gave me energy. They gave me um, the enthusiasm. And our catchphrase was passion, ownership, and a sense of urgency. Are you passionate for this brand? Do you feel like you own it? And all of them did own it. Everybody had a piece of equity in the company and a sense of urgency to get things done. And as we built out our team, we, we were able to build out our consumer base. So we moved out of the yoga studios, first the triathletes, then the cyclists, um, then started moving to natural foods, moms that were looking for natural alternatives, uh, kids that were, were, you know, weren't raised on sugar and were willing to accept an alternatives, all age groups. And we're able to step up with uh, additional resources our scale. So this is a, a transportation bus, but we did have distribution trucks running around branded that big. Not all of them had Zico all the time. You know, it's the game you play about branding, but we're able to step up, step up our message. All this to date um, is still, still in New York. Getting uh, uh, now some serious facings and in, 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 in material uh, coolers, and getting to a point where we have displays that rival you know, not just beverage brands, but rival, rival produce brands. And actually got to a point where we knew, when we finally knew it was a category, it was when Whole Foods put a sign up in Austin that's, that recognized that it's a, it's, it's a category. And, and I'll be real frank about that. This was built in a category, which is an extremely dip, challenging uh, proposition. It helps to have competition as much as we wanted to crush and differentiate from, our, differentiate from our competition. We had three direct competitors for a while. There's no way we could have built it individually. So collectively doing this sort of work um, ultimately helped us all. But it was still a family affair. Um, so I still had to get uh, more involved and the girls involved to, uh, to, to you know, uh, and they wanted to be. You know, my girls are, are now uh, 12 and 14 and look back and wish they had done more uh, in, in, in the business. But not to say that it's all smooth sailing. So about six months into uh, the business, I get this notice in the, in the mail. Uh, January of 2005, we launched in June of 2004 from the FDA, notifying us that our product is now under embargo. Um, there was no health issue. It turned out that there was a paperwork glitch from our producer in Brazil, but they, prior to us, were selling to a few other uh, companies or tried their own brand for a little while, but they were importing a pallet here, a half a container there. We started importing five containers at a time. So all of a sudden, somebody in the FDA says, we gotta check this out a little bit more, and the paperwork wasn't in order. Um, and so we're stuck. So around this time, I am, um, have a personal coach that I'm engaged with, an Aussie that I do phone consultation with. That's a long story how I found him, but we would talk every couple weeks about key issues in the business. So I get on the phone with him one day, and, and uh, Jeff in his cheery Aussie voice says, how's it going, Mark? 
And I say, not well, Jeff. I just got this notice from the FDA. I can't import any product. Um, I can't bring in new product until this is cleared. I can't sell what I have. In fact, I may have to, if they really want to get serious about it, I may have to recall it. And I have to recall it, it's like, it's over. I mean, a brand our size doesn't come back from a recall. And, and Jeff said, Mark, is it really that bad? I mean, I'm sure you're going to find some solution. Let's talk about some of the solutions. And I said, Jeff, I don't think you get it. This is, this is it. I, I have, we put every penny we had into this business. I'm barely taking out any money uh, month to month. We borrowed money from our parents to buy this house we're in. There's nothing left. I don't know how I'm going to pay my mortgage next month, let alone my Amex bill. I, I, this, is, this is it. So Jeff says, Mark, go to your front window. I'm like, Jeff, what are, you, what are you talking about? Go to my front window. I got product. What are you? Mark, humor me. Go to your front window. So I go to the window. Jeff, I'm out the window. Look outside. Do you see a white van in your drive? I said, no, Jeff, there's no white van. He said, do you see two guys in white suits? I'm like, no, Jeff, there's no guys in white suits. What are you going to? What's this all about? And he said, Mark, are you telling me nobody's going to, there's not two guys, they're going to throw you in a white jacket, put you in the back of a padded van, and take you away for the next 25 years? I say, no. What are you crying about? What are you whining about? Mark, you'll probably figure it out, but you're young. You're well-educated. You you've done this corporate thing. You've given it, given it a shot. If it does fail, so what? But what's really going to happen? You're probably not going to lose your house, but even if you do, so what? And the, it took me a while for it to sink in. But the realization I had then, which I would never trade, I would trade everything we've, all the success we've had in Zico for this lesson, is know you've already won. And that only came through those tough times of realizing that at the end of the day, it's life. The reality is for most of us in this world, we, in this room, we don't have problems, right? I hope you can recognize that and really believe it. And, and, and for most people in the world, that's the case. We're lucky to be educated. We're lucky to be living in this country, to be starting businesses in the country, to be attending schools like this. But more fundamentally, we're lucky to be alive, right? And that realization, it took some time, was powerful for me. And it also helped me to overcome this obstacle and many others, to be able to confront this without worrying. We'll figure that out. We'll figure that out. Right now, I got to deal with the FDA. Okay, dealt with the FDA. Right now, I got to deal with getting product back on the shelf. Right now, I got to deal with raising money. And you deal with the problems that are in front of you, knowing that at the end of the day, you need, we, we need to celebrate being alive. So a couple of battlefield notes. Um, uh, some of this for me is reiterated uh, from the conversation you had earlier, uh, but just some thoughts that I had, imagining myself in your shoes, a few parting thoughts that I hope can add a little bit of value. And again, I'm going to push, push the limit on people's reading here. This is an old school one. Anybody know the name of this author? Small is Beautiful. Great, great book written in the 70s, E.F. Schumacher. Um, basically, an economist that wrote about this as an economics principle, which is fascinating. Goes in the face of the World Bank, the Investment Development Bank, all the, what we think about development had been questioned back in the 70s. But what I liked about this title is the idea of living below your means. And I think somebody was talking about, the, the panelists were talking about that earlier, how important it is at your stage in life right now to take advantage of that and recognize it as an asset $13 a day was what I made in the Peace Corps, um, and it was one of the best times of my life, right? Post-MBA, you know, I, I did okay. I think I made 70 grand my, my first year, which was pretty good at the time, but we had more than I combined, had 140000 in debt. We lived in Memphis, and we lived cheap, drove the same damn old cars, lived in a cheap apartment, and paid down debt. We didn't have any money from our families. But over the next number of years, we were able to save money that helped start Zico. At the same time, when we started Zico, um, we, were, we were married. We did have kids. It's a, it's a, it is a tougher challenge there. But we went from basically moving back to the States. My income was cut by 
in to one third and my expenses tripled. So you do the math. It, it wasn't working out well. What helped was we were cool with that. We were cool rice and beans every night. Our, our vacations were uh, you, you know, going to Jersey Shore versus uh, go, going to rent a beautiful place in the Caribbean. Um, we were willing to do whatever it took. And I can't uh, tell you how important I think that is as an, as an asset as you go forward. And it doesn't end when you're 45 or 55. I have a friend that's a brilliant business person, um, was a turnaround guy, uh, run big businesses, run small businesses. He's now um, running a very successful startup in the, in the natural food space. Um, he's positioned to make a lot of money if this thing flips. And, and we're having a very frank conversation and he's nervous because he needs a million dollars a year to live. That's his lifestyle, that's what it is. And that's, that's fine, that's his choice, I'm not critiquing that, but that means at 55, he's gotta go do it again, <laughs> right? So I would encourage you to set yourselves up for success, build those, take advantage of it now. You're most of you are living poor now, right? Take advantage of that, it's an asset. Use it to your advantage over time. Take thought time. This, I only, I, first time I ever heard in my life was when I was probably four years into running this business in Latin America, it was from my father-in-law, a, a brilliant guy, world-renowned neuroscientist actually, that came down, saw the business, met my team, and said, Mark, wh when do you and how do you think about the business? And I said, well, you know, we have strategy meetings, we do planning, we do these exercises, we get outside. I don't know. When do you take time to think about the business? And what he challenged me to do was carve out thought time every week, every week, at least two hours every week. And I'll tell you, it was tough. For the first couple times I did it, I'd put my head down and fall asleep. I'd have a blank paper. You know, I didn't get a lot out of it. But over time, I started to get huge value in it. Everything that Zico was out of the gate came from those thought time. A, a number of great, great innovations in the business came out of that. All key decisions we've taken to grow the brand, most of them came out of that. And the new ventures that I'm onto now have come out of that. And it's the discipline of taking time to think, especially in this day and age. And I'm telling you, you have the time. And again, you have no time right now, right? But if you can carve it now, you'll learn it and can develop that habit. So I can't uh, emphasize that enough. We talked about that a little bit, and I think, um, I think um, we've heard some good examples of that on dipping your toe before, before you burn the bridges. <laughs> I think there are ways to, to uh, do this intelligently. Keep your day job for a period of time. Work on your business plan. Raise some money. Uh, test it out. Go to market if you can. I didn't quit my job until we had developed a business plan, raised a million dollars, uh, had our first production, went to a trade show in New York, had a great success at that trade show, and got on the CNBC that night after the trade show. And I finally turned to my wife and I said, it's time. If I'm ever going to do this, it's now. Um, and I'd encourage you to do that. Now, again, if you're able to start it um, earlier uh, now and think about things, that's great. But this is something that can serve you well, whatever it is, be it a couple years out uh, 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 in, in, in the corporate world. But I think there's ways to do that. Have a plan B. So this is me on a beach in Costa Rica during the Peace Corps. And this was our plan B. So my wife and I, you know, some people argue burn the ships, don't look back, go 100% forward. Um, I felt it was helpful to have a very flushed out plan B. So literally we had written out our plan B. Our plan B was we sell our house in New Jersey, we pay back our parents as much as we can for that, we take a little bit, we don't need a much, probably 20 grand, we move to uh, El Salvador, somewhere in Central America and we're gonna take a year. Work when we need to work, we had two little girls, we'll figure it out, homeschool and whatever. We had flushed it out. We knew what that looked like, and I gotta tell you, it's pretty damn appealing. I wonder at times if that would have been a better scenario. But the act of really flushing out that plan B, ironically, gave me more confidence to go forward, more confidence to risk it, because we knew and were aligned on, on, on what that looked like. Get on the ego reduction program. <laughs> Um, look, it's, it's the reality. It's, I think it's the most dangerous word in the English language, the ego. And I'd encourage you to read up on it, 
study it, understand it, do internal reflection, understand your mind and understand how it can wreak havoc with your life and our world. It's amazing how many really dumb decisions I've made based on ego. It's amazing how valuable it's been to get it crushed <laughs> again and again and again and get to a point where I can be as close to honest and authentic and have real conversations with people, look at situations in a real way without being burdened by, by all this stuff. Um, Enjoy the ride. Uh, I love this quote from, I've seen it attributed to a couple people, but I'm pretty sure it's Hunter S. Thomas. Life is not a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a pretty and well-preserved body, but rather to slide in broadside, thoroughly used up, totally worn out, and loudly proclaiming, I think he said, shit, what a ride. You know? It's life. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a ride. It's a ride. It's a journey. I really encourage you. Enjoy it. Embrace it dive into it, and the future will work itself out. Thank you. Yeah, questions? Sure, yeah. So, uh, open the questions. Oh, we're going to do... Yes, first. Okay, questions first. Gif gifts can wait. Uh, yes? So you mentioned about um, when you're building your team and, and hiring those employees, the, the biggest thing was for them, I guess the criteria was for them to walk through that wall. Yeah. Uh, so, so what does that mean? Like, how did you evaluate that? Yeah. Was it because they knew about Zico already, or did they, did they have this excitement about, about that? Yeah, yeah it's a great, great point. Generally, first of all, I'll be real frank, I hired about... Uh, six MBAs in the whole trajectory of Zico, three worked out, three didn't. And I was hesitant on, on MBAs. Um, and in general, in, in businesses I, I'm involved in, I am as well, right? When there are exceptions, they tend to be phenomenal, right? My head of marketing w w was an MBA, a couple of uh, uh, CEOs of companies I'm invested in now are MBAs. But my, my worry with people that have MBAs or have typical corporate experiences they're not willing to roll their sleeves up. And it's one thing to say it, but in our business, that literally means roll up your sleeves, load up your truck, your car with product, drive it down, and do whatever it takes to get on that shelf. And do it again and again and again and again. And I don't care if you're you know, the lowest person on the, uh, on the totem pole or you are the CMO, that's what it takes in this business. And so I developed an ability to assess that, right, and understand part of its track record, part of its um, um, network. I, I got to a point where I rarely hired anyone I didn't know. And in fact, of anybody in our company, I probably had the worst hiring track record. Because, <laughs> you know, I'd sometimes use recruiters for this, or I'd go on references. The team that I built, they knew, you don't hire anyone you don't know. And because you're in the foxholes with them, right? And so, so that network was critical. And so I value um, passion, enthusiasm over intelligence. I value um, um, uh, street experience, bruises and cuts over, over strategy. Um, I just think that in, in the businesses I know, um, that matters. Now, when you can get both, it's powerful. When you can get somebody that can be strategic, understand strategy, and I think Kip said it well, when you can, when you can understand how you can fit and solve a problem for, for a business, that's gold, that's gold. But at the same time, you gotta be flexible to do whatever it takes, right? They're not nine to five jobs. They're, they're, it's basically investment banking jobs without the pay, um, and you actually get dirty. But there's people that love that. There's people that are like, ah, I don't wanna work in an office, I remember my, my, my uh, head of sales, my, my first like real sales hire, this guy Andy, he was a guy, when I would go in um, to our distributor in New York that carried vitamin water and Zico, um, he, was, he ran the vitamin water New York team. So he had about 20 people working for him. This was like Mr. Cool, right? Walks in the room, he's high-fiving everybody, low-fiving everybody, cracking jokes with everybody, loved him. He's the kind of guy that would joke that he's the smartest guy in the room because he went to Frostburg State for five years. Um, and, uh, and, uh, but um, he, he just knew how to get it done. So I remember interviewing him 
at a bar in Hoboken where he, where he lived, and he shows up in flip-flops and shorts, and I knew he was pushing me, right? He was trying to get a sense of, yeah, this guy talks the game, but is he really cool with this kind of laid-back, whatever-it-takes-lifestyle? And, and we're talking, and I uh, get to talking, and I say, look, here's, I think, I think I'd love you to take this job, and here's the three things I'd ask for you. He, he said his goal was to live in the Northwest, work his tail off, but also uh, uh, kayak, paddleboard, and, and, and ski when he had free time. So I said, look, here's the deal. Um, come in, uh, build a great team, triple the business, hire and train your replacement, and you have my word, I will do everything you can to get out to the West Coast. And he said, one, two, okay. I don't know about the first two, but I know the third, my replacement, his name's Buck Williams. And, and he was right. Right? He was right. He, he, he's a jokester, right? But he came in and grew the team, tripled the business, had already hired his replacement. And so, you know, he's, he's the guy. But he just knew what it took. But he's, you know, not MBA. He also was very clear. I never want to be your head, head of sales. And you will never let me be your head of sales, Mark. So let's just be frank about that, right? But it worked. So if you didn't take the corporate job after few, what do you think you still would have uh, successfully launched the company? That's a great question. Um, I don't know because I'm, I'm just pragmatic and think that, you know, life takes its twists and turns. I don't think I would have started Zico. Um, and, and, uh, but I don't think, I'm, I, I'm certain I didn't need the MBA to do it. It was a challenge, and I'll give you uh, one example of the challenge. Um, but ultimately, I have no regrets about it. I learned a ton. It gives me a perspective, I think, that helped. It did give credibility at a certain point. But here's where it was a challenge. So I'm, I'm running this business in Latin America. You know, I've got 300 employees, a big team, teams all over the place. So I'm used to team, team, team. You know, take great people, give them a lot of rope, give them some resources and opportunity, and let them run. So I hired a couple consultants to do some marketing research, kind of help us build the brand. Smart guys out of New York, but advertising guys. And they came to me and said, we want to launch it. We love it. We want to quit our jobs. We want to launch this. We want to, we want to go for it. We want, to, we want to help you launch the brand. And I thought, man, smart guys, you know, experienced um, in, in their own world, uh, energetic, ready. To, and they, they, they showed me they could do what it takes. They were working the streets and stuff like that. And I said, sure, I'm going to give them a shot at doing that. Dumbest idea I made. Wonderful guys. I'm still friends with this, them to this day. They didn't know the business. They didn't understand what it was really going to take. And I was delegating something I didn't know well enough to delegate, right? And so that was an MBA move. It was, it was uh, find smart people, give them resources, and let them run. Well, you know, uh, I didn't have time to fail. And so we burned through a couple hundred thousand dollars in some dumb moves while they were learning the business, right? So I think it has its risks. But you got to play to your advantages, right, and understand where your strengths and weaknesses are, get your ego out of the way, find people that know something better to you, than you, and let them help you do it. We have time for one more question. Uh, my question is to you on your team. So when you formed Zico, uh, I see your team has multiple Olympic uh, gold medalists, uh, soul surfers, and whatnot. But when you form a team to start a venture, do you rely on uh, the close, near and dear ones? Uh, who are capable enough to join your uh, idea? Or is it to go out there and then hire the capabilities and, uh, based on, for running a business? Right, so, so great question. I'll tell you what I did. I'll tell you what I might do differently and different approaches on it. So um, I learned and found that after this mistake of getting kind of higher paid, less industry specific people I went the opposite. I eventually brought in, later brought in kind of real experts. I brought people in I knew and could trust to get things done. And I frankly brought in also a lot of young kids willing to proverbial run through walls. Just go get done whatever it takes to get this task done. So I did not, all those athletes, all those celebrities, that came later. It all came organically. Eventually we did sign some deals with them, but they were all drinking it organically. Um, the industry experts came later, uh, but I advise businesses to do it sooner, right? So I think there's, there's you, know, you got to find the right balance for you, for your business, for your industry. I see some businesses that are so top heavy, right? You got, I have a friend that's starting a business and he's got, 
the board of advisors is off the charts. I mean, it's, but it's like 15 people that are come from all this high level stuff. He's got no Indians. He's got all chiefs running around, right? So that's, I know it's not gonna work and he's, he's, he's struggling because of that. I've, I see other businesses that are all, 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 all Indians. It's all, you know, it's, it's, it's and excuse the terrible uh, uh, cultural inappropriate uh, comparison I'm making here, but um, junior people running around, you know, uh, um, um, executing things with no thought process in it, right? So I think there's a time and place for finding that right balance. Um, but I do believe that having experts around, a few, two or three, four people that really know the industry that can be advisors, not involved in day-to-day -day that are there, having a couple people close to you, I, I did not, this wasn't a partnership for me, but I've seen businesses work really well with two or three partners. I think there's, a, there's an interesting model for that, but then I also think you need some lower level people that are just gonna get things done, right? So that's generally what I've seen work.